welcome. Uh, my name is Conrad Waters, and I'm uh, with uh, Southminster. Can't hear? No, well, that's good. Can you, you should be able to hear now, I guess. My name is Conrad Waters, and I'm associated with the, um, the council at uh, Southminster. And I've been asked to um, jump in to say a few words first. Um, uh, a couple of things is that, as most of you know, and most of you are probably uh, repeat uh, music lovers, uh, that it um, is a, an outreach program uh, through Southminster as a, um, as a means of uh, allowing people to enjoy the, the beauty of the structure of the church and the uh, great musicians that we're able to, to have um, on a weekly basis. The, it is run as a, front, a free will offering to the uh, church to uh, look after the costs of it, including for the musicians. Um, and we've been very fortunate to have such a uh, dedicated group of listeners who uh, have uh, obviously thoroughly enjoyed over the years the, uh, the music we were able to present. As a different um, approach, though, I'm going to mention that I was thinking last night that it may be that because it is such a beautiful church, at least, at least it is for me and I'm sure for you too, that at the end of the, um, of the music concert, if people want to sort of sit in their pews as the uh, activities of the, um, the dom settle down and the, and the um, instruments are, are leave, if they want to stay for another half hour or three quarters of an hour uh, as a sort of a quiet time or meditative time, or if you have a friend who you just want to sit down and talk with because you only see them once a week, then just feel free to use the space. Uh, and uh, it may be something that is uh, worthwhile for people as a meeting place, as a social meeting place uh, after the, uh, the concert for those who are interested. I apologize for the city for not having um, plow the uh, front sidewalk. I've, uh, I asked them to do that yesterday and again this morning and I'm sure they'll get on to it over the next week or so. Uh, it's mainly in due to the sign that the we're not supposed to be walking in the sidewalks here, but I emphasize to them that there we have quite a number of people who are coming on Wednesdays and on and Saturdays and Sundays in particular who have to be able to get up and down the street. And it's not associated with the construction zone, which is farther west, the, last, the uh, western half of, this, uh, uh, of the sidewalk. The... Um, You'll often hear my wife um, doing this talk, and she's much better than I, but I tend to get the information out as I can. Um, so those are the main things. Uh, consider yourselves all friends of Southminster. We appreciate your, your, uh, the energy that you bring to the church and your interest in the welfare of the church as well. Um, now I'd like to um, turn it over to um, uh, Peter and uh, his... Uh, his musical um, friends, and we're going to have a, uh, I'm sure, uh, a re repeat of a, um, a great uh, jazz session, and this is entitled Jazz in the Key of Atwood. Enjoy yourself. Thank you. Thanks, Conrad, and uh, thanks for being here with us this, uh, uh, this noon hour, and uh, great to be connecting online as well. As, uh, as we take some time, I just wanted to say, a little frame, offer a bit of a frame for the next 50 or so minutes of music um, and maybe and just lay it out ahead of time before we start playing. It is such a pleasure to be here today playing music. I've been involved with this concert series I think most of the most years and, and your concert series has fostered musical projects and collaborations and created opportunities not just for myself, for many people in the Ottawa music communities. So uh, hats off to Southminster. I'm here today with a, a project, we call ourselves Field Notes as a ensemble, and it's uh, Kyle Jordan on guitar, Jacob Clark on bass and, uh, and cello as well, and myself, Peter Woods on saxophone. Um, we're gonna be talking uh, briefly through the next hour about Margaret Atwood and offering um, because part of, the, part of the ambition of the project, which has been sort of cooking up for a little while, um, especially looking at other art forms and how they speak to music or, or what we're hearing when we're engaged by other art forms, specifically literature. So last year, um, 
We were part of a deep dive around a poet, a Canadian poet and philosopher, Jan Zwicky. And over the last few months, we've been really focusing on Margaret Atwood, and it's been a blast to be having these conversations and, and favorite readings and podcasts. I mean, uh, Margaret Atwood, of, of, of course, as, as I assume most of us are aware, is, is uh, one of the great writers on our planet in this time, um, an iconic Canadian, uh, born in Ottawa, and, uh, and somebody who has not only brought uh, her literary universe to life over the, the last, I mean, she's now in her, well, well into, I guess, her 80s, and continues to explore new territory and new publications, and along the way has, in many ways, shaped um, our collective uh, consciousness over the last few decades, and has steered the Canadian conversation in certain directions and the global conversation in very profound ways um, I, I, I guess the one we're all so aware of um, is The Handmaid's Tale, which is now over 30 years old and continues to sound like, like, uh, like a, a newscast um, when, we, when many of us engage with that work of literature. So today, this, uh, um, thinking about not just The Handmaid's Tale, or not only The Handmaid's Tale, but some of the, some of the times where her work has been set to film there's, there's, a, there's two overlays we're, we're bringing today. One is the, that of what's called the music supervisor, which in a, in a TV show or a movie, there's somebody that is, that's their title, and their task is to, is to sort of imagine what songs from various sources might speak to, to a scene. And, uh, and so we had sort of maybe the overly ambitious uh, uh, task set that we set before ourselves. Of, um, imagine an hour just spent dwelling in that literary universe of Margaret Atwood. What would the music supervisor select out of, uh, out of what's in our ears what, and what we can play? Um, and what might speak to various themes? And, and so that's one of the threads going through the next hour is just wondering what, what sort of soundtrack music, music sources might we be able to move, weave into the Atwood universe. Um, and I'll be brief about the other one. The other one is, it's called the homiletical stance. And that's something that's familiar at Southminster as a place of, uh, of Christian worship. And I'm a, I'm a United Church minister as well at Mackay United Church in New Edinburgh. And one of the things that when we look at texts on, on Sunday morning, we do two things. We look at the text and we look at the world. And usually, and, and we try to say, try to resonate with what is the text. And in many cases, it would be the Hebrew or Christian scriptures. Um, what would, what are those things say? What are those things speaking to us about life? And, and then, equally important, look at life and say, what's, what's being spoken? Well, as one of my friends said, why do you only read the Bible on Sunday morning? Should be reading people like Margaret Atwood. These great voices, these prophetic voices, and I mean prophecy in the real Hebraic sense, which was not about looking in a crystal ball and, and, and guessing or, or saying that I know what's going to happen in the future. It, as Atwood would say, if I see there's a hole in the road up ahead, I'm going to tell you there's a hole in the road up ahead. It's practical, prophetic advice. And, and so we turn, that was the homiletical stance around Atwood, would be to say, what are, what are the texts saying to us and what, um, what is life saying to us? And Atwood is first and uh, alongside, first and foremost, an artist. But she's an artist of the moment. She's a realist through and through. She says that again and again in almost every interview. She's telling us the climate crisis. She's speaking to us about uh, uh, violence against women. She's speaking hard, hard truths about what's happening in, currently in Ukraine, in Russia. She is always speaking the truth, her truth, the truth she sees, and, and doing it with passion. So, so that, would be the, that would be the two overlays, music supervisor and, and that sort of, that, that tradition of looking at the text, looking at reality. That's a long intro for a music show. 
Um, so we're going to get to that. Uh, and one of the things that we discovered along the way was there was a lot of originals that we were, that were in our repertoire that felt right for this moment. So you're going to hear, as you can see in the program, much of, the, of today is actually the composers are here with you as well, uh, Jacob and Kyle. With all that said, you'll hear more little fragments of Atwood spoken through the next hour, thanks to us, and, and we've got a guest with us, Carolyn Sutherland, who reads poetry at many of our events. She's going to offer two brief poems as well. So you're going to hear a few words of Atwood, but mostly a sweep of music that we feel does that work, well, that, that Atwood inspires us to do this musical work in this moment. <clears throat>
The Moment by Margaret Atwood. The moment when, after many years of hard work and a long voyage, you stand in the center of your room, house, half acre, square mile, island, country, knowing at last how you got there and say, I own this, is the same moment when the trees unloose their soft arms from around you, the birds take back their language, the cliffs fissure and collapse, the air moves back from you like a wave and you can't breathe. No, they whisper, you own nothing. You were a visitor time after time, climbing the hill, planting the flag, proclaiming. We never belong to you. You never found us. It was always the other way around. Thank you. 
love so long. Thank you, that's a Tom Waits tune. Uh, so this next composition is one of mine. It's called Signals. Um, it's really improvised based with some instructions. Um, one of them being this little piece I wrote. So here we go. Um, a faint message through fuzzy static, scanning the channels with what tools are left. What signals catch our attention? Why? Are they the loudest, the strongest? Who is behind them? What is their message? What's their intent? What narratives can we build around the signals we send and receive? Thank you. 
So this is a piece with a pretty close story to my heart. Um, to give you a little backstory, so the title Love Song for a Fading Mind is really enough to encompass the whole feeling that I had about this. When my grandparents reached around their 80s, my grandfather just sort of started to fade away as some people do, they tend to lose their mental facilities and it sort of feels like you're gradually losing this person or maybe that that person is still here but inaccessible. They're unable to go back and access that part of them that you grew to know, know and love. And the idea behind this piece was that it would be sort of a country tune. My parents were obsessed with country music. And there's no lyrics to it today, but it's a story that is my grandmother singing a song to my grandfather and sort of talking about having to lose him without really getting to say goodbye. Because it happens so gradually, just moment by moment, one day, you wake up and this memory is gone. One day you wake up and he's back and everything's great. So you don't really know when to say goodbye properly. And tragically, they will never get to hear this song, not on this earth with their ears at least. And to me, uh, I, I think it's important to remember that sometimes when we write music for somebody, it's also for ourselves, for our own understanding of what happened and kind of coming to terms with how they must have felt in that moment. So this song is Love Song for a Fading Mind.
Thank you. That's for Gene and Alan Clark. Late Poems by Margaret Atwood. These are the late poems. Most poems are late, of course. Too late, like a letter sent by a sailor that arrives after he's drowned. Too late to be of help, such letters. And late poems are similar. They arrive as if through water. Whatever it was has happened. The battle, the sunny day, the moonlit slipping into lust, the farewell kiss. The poem washes ashore like flotsam. Or late, as in late for supper, all the words cold or eaten, scoundrel, plight, vanquished, or linger, bide a while, forsaken, wept, forlorn. Love and joy even, thrice gnawed songs, Rusted spells, worn choruses. It's late, it's very late. Too late for dancing. Still, sing what you can. Turn up the light. Sing on. Sing on. So this next piece is another one of mine, and I'd like to preface it with just a little quote from uh, Margaret Atwood on why even the bleakest post-apocalyptic novels are deep down full of hope. Any novel is hopeful, and that is presupposes a reader. It is actually a hopeful act just to write anything, really, because you're assuming that someone will be around to read it. Thank you. 
just like a like any typical uh, jazz ensemble, we're going to change the order a little bit here and play, uh, <laughs> move things around a little bit. Um, I'm going to invite you to a, a short thought exercise that comes from Atwood's pen. And the, the real question is, what song would you be? Um, what song uh, would you be? And I'm going to preface that. I'm going to invite you to hear this brief, brief poem. And it's one of her later poems, one of her more recent uh, poems. It just it is, it, I, I hear it as an invitation to offer on a musical noon hour as uh, a, pa a place to pause and think about the song that is you um, or the, uh, the melody that, that, you, that draws you forward or that does whatever, does, does something in, and stirs your heart, your soul, your mind, your body. Um, so, uh, what song would you be is really not a song, it's just a, an, in, an invite to, to, for you to take a moment of silence and then, and then I'm going to share, I, and because I had to do a program ahead of time, I had to declare what my song was going to be, and it's going to be Blue Moon. So that's me. Uh, uh, so I'll bring us into Blue Moon in a second, uh, a song that's kind of close to my heart and swings, and, and actually the original title for Blue Moon was, was Heaven. It was, that was the original title for the tune before uh, Rogers and Hart, I guess, uh, made it into, turned it into Blue Moon. So, uh, so let's call, I'm going to call it Heaven today and say that's, that's the song that, uh, that is, that, what, that's the song that's me today. What song would you be? If you were a song, what song would you be? Would you be the voice that sings? Would you be the music? When I am singing this song for you, you are not empty air. You are here, one breath, and then another. You are here with me.
Paul Jordan on guitar. Thank you. Um, we're cut, we've got one last tune I, we'd like to offer you this afternoon, and it is one of uh, uh, one by Kyle again, and uh, and it's called Waking. We've been playing it uh, a fair bit in and thinking, and and you know really not wanting to sum up in any way, presume to sum up Margaret Atwood's work, but one of the frames are, well is around realism. <laughs> Her ability, and I, and I know she talks about having been shaped and studied, uh, having studied 19th century realist fiction and, and really observing what's going on in the world and, and being very, like when people say, oh, you're, you're, you know, you're so brilliant, often, or, or so uh, prescient, often what she says, well, I'm, I'm just seeing what's there. I'm just seeing what's in front of me and telling you what it is um, and claiming this, this very clear realism. And... My experience of many of her novels is there's, there's sort of a, a very frank and forthright beginning and, and a rather realistic summation at the end. And there could be incredible, complex, otherworldly adventures in the middle, but framed around a, a, almost a, a discipline of being, uh, um, I was going to say a servant, uh, being, being uh, attentive to the world around her. Uh, which is a calling in music. It's a calling in music for us to pay attention to what Jacob just played on the bass and, and respond, or the cello. 
Um, it's, it's a res but it's also in our human community, obviously. So there's a call buried in there for, for that I, we want to lift up at the end of our hour today of waking. That again and again, Atwood's work has awoken us to realities, uh, the social, environmental, political, uh, uh, gender realities, and taught us things, um, as others have as well, but she's done it so amazingly. She's one of our, our Canadian leaders, icons, and, and to just acknowledge the power of that work and how that's a call to wake up. Uh, wake up not to some other world, but wake up to this world and be awoken again and again to the realities all around us to be educated and taught and, and to just wake up. So we, that led us to wanting to round out the hour with uh, Kyle's composition, Waking.
Thank you very much. Thanks for being here. Thanks, uh, Peter Woods, Kyle Jordan, Jacob Clark. Field notes. Let's see ya. That was terrific. I want to remind people too, as I mentioned earlier, that if you want to stay in the sanctuary afterwards for a while longer, just keep that in mind. You're certainly welcome to. Thank you very much, uh, Peter, Carol, <laughs> Weil, and, and uh, <laughs> Thank you, Carolyn. <laughs> Thank you, Carolyn. <laughs> I got to say, yeah, for doing those readings. Thank you.